Peter Thiel. You met That's him? your guy? Never. That's cool. He run, the, Peter Thiel is the, like, the Thiel guy, right, that I've heard of? Yeah. I hear he's quite the guy. He's the one. <laughs> I'm sure you have mutual friends and stuff. Definitely do, definitely do. Kyle, are those Yeezys? They are. That's real. I, I don't know if I've ever seen one any of those in the field. Loves his Yeezys. All right, we're good. Fantastic. Good to go. All right, man, it's your show. Yeah. Congressman, welcome to Tucson. Hey, I'm happy to be here in Arizona. I mean, this state is known as the border security and election integrity mecca of the world. We're trying to get there. Absolutely. We got, we got a few problems on each front, though. Well, I'll tell you, that's the problem because you, you you have to rely on politicians to get both of those things done. And as you know, as you're soon to be a politician, alas, unreliable, unreliable people. To say the least. Yes. I'm curious. So I see we're like 100 miles north of the border right now. Uh, if you drive just a few miles away, you will see tent encampments. You will see hotels full of illegal aliens, right? So we actually like see and feel the effects here. Uh, curious if people in North Carolina, like is the border an abstraction? Do you actually see the consequences of the open border? Like, how are people feeling about it there? So I'll tell you, if you poll North Carolina as a whole, uh, border security ranks number two. Really? Uh, yeah, right behind the economy right now. And it's because of the dereliction of duty that's happened from whether it's Secretary Mayorkas at DHS with the border security fiasco or if it's Biden himself. Um, when you look at what's happened in the country, every state has become a border state by proxy. The reason being, uh, I was down in the southern tip uh, in McAllen, Texas. Uh, really with a bunch of the Border Patrol agents. I went down with our the former president. He was showing us everything that was going on down there, really getting some firsthand knowledge, and then needed to get back to Washington, D.C. for votes. Uh, but my team was having a hard time getting me on a plane, and finally they get me one late afternoon. I get on that plane, and we're looking around. I literally call my guy, Stephen. I'm like, Stephen, why, why did it take you so long to get me on this plane? There's like 25 open seats. This is insane. Uh -oh. And then you know, he's like, I have no idea. They, I promise you, they said they were sold out. I was like, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. So then the boarding door closes on the left of the airplane, like you know. And then, interestingly enough, the right side door opens where they normally bring in the, uh, the little trolleys with the food on them. And then in walk a significant amount of Hispanic re refugees walking onto our plane. And now the reason why I know that they are illegal immigrants, I'm not racially profiling them, is because a really young, cute little girl sat beside me and her young mom sat beside me. They spoke a good amount of English. And so I started talking to them, and they were telling me that, yes, they had just come across the border. Uh, they had been at what, you know, basically had these encampments, these holding facilities, or basically just welcoming parties now. And then they were all given a manila envelope. Every single one of these people had a manila envelope. On the front with a Sharpie is written a big name of a city, and then it is taxpayer-funded airline tickets into those cities. And so they were literally transporting these illegal immigrants into the heartland of America. So, yep. yes, we feel the effects heavily in North Carolina. Yep. And um, I guess that's the strategy, right? Because there's so many people coming in. If they all just stayed here in Tucson, right. in Arizona, like we'd notice. Exactly. Like we'd really notice, right? Because it's 225000 a month, run, run rate of $2.4 million a year. So over four years, quick math, try, that's like eight or nine million people over a Biden-Harris administration. But like, we only have that many people in Arizona. And remember. So they have to distribute them to the interior just to make just, them blend in. Just to, bl just to mask it. But remember. Over the last six decades, because of weak Republican leadership, the radical left has been able to turn our country into a, what, what is about to become what we would call a welfare state. Everything, so many social programs, so many taxpayer funded things where, and you know, you and I, I I'm sure we agree, we don't have a problem helping the needy. Sure. We don't want to fund Gotta have a safety lazy. net. Exactly. We, we don't want to hit the net, bounce up, get back into the work. Exactly. Class, We're here just class. to you know, give you a quick hand up. I mean, it, it's, it's a masculine American thing to do to help your neighbor. But we're not here to fund the lazy. And when you bring in all these illegal immigrants and you have this welfare state, I believe the true purpose of that is that in 2024, I think the Democrats are going to run on saying, uh, really saying you people can become citizens. Yep. And then once they all become citizens, they get put into that welfare system and it's going to destroy the capitalist market Just mass system. Mass amnesty. Exactly. We and see some of the amnesty in the Build Back Better bill, which hopefully is failing. Hopefully. I, I mean, I have never prayed for a Democratic senator so much in my life, but Joe Manchin is the man. Not in the habit of praising Democrats, but yeah, actually, thank goodness for him, right? He's, he's, he, I, I, I even hesitate to call him a, a Democrat. I mean, he's a lot like in the same vein as Rand Paul, just right. a statesman, just serves his constituents well. Well, I think every county in West Virginia voted big for Trump. Yes. Right? So he's yeah. actually just 
serving his constituents, right? He's exactly. reflecting what they want. All these people are like, how dare one senator block the will of 49? And it's like, no, there's actually like 51. It's like 51. <laughs> 51, just, 51 you know, 49, that's the way it's supposed to work. I don't know if you've read the Constitution, but it takes 51% to win. So. It's crazy, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, crazy stat. More people have come through the southern border in the last 60 days than live in Wyoming. That's, in, that's insane. I mean, now, Blake, you, I, you and I probably agree. These, most of the people coming across, they're not militants. They're not here to hurt. They just want a better life. But when you They're responding start, to individual incentives. Like, I get it. Oh, exactly. We'd probably be trying to do the we same thing. We probably would, yes. It doesn't mean we should be allowed to. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a border. Right. But, I mean, if, if you hear that the border's open, you hear that they're going to be giving you $450,000 if you get separated from your family. Sounds like a pretty good deal. I mean, I'm thinking about just flying down to Mexico City and illegally crossing. It's, it's, a, it's a great profit margin. Uh, but when you start thinking about it, I mean, in a way, this is really an invasion. It's an invasion of our culture. It's an invasion of our heritage. And that's something that I think we all need to scrutinize and fiercely oppose. Yeah, totally. It was interesting, because a few months ago, I think Tucker, they're always trying to cancel Tucker. Always. Course, right? Uncancelable. And I think he's uncancelable. That's why he's the most popular, right? Uh, but he said, I think he connected the, the dots that you're not supposed to connect. And he said, like, this mass immigration is obviously it's an electoral strategy. Yes. Right? And you're not supposed to connect the dots, even though it's like obviously open borders, mass immigration, and then they also want unlimited mail-in voting, and you see these amnesty provisions in Build Back Better. You know, I think there's an op-ed in the New York Times recently saying that uh, you shouldn't have to be a citizen in order to vote, right? Because a community has many political stakeholders, and non-citizens and visitors have a, you know, it's just like, which what is insane. But if you connect these things and say the mass immigration is obviously about creating more voters someday, people who the left thinks will vote Democrat. I'm not even sure that's true, by the way, but you're called a racist. It, you're called racist, absolutely. And it, this is one of the things, it's, things are so obvious in this country. I mean, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, I would consider myself something of somebody who just says, things are not adding up and it's extremely obvious. And that's why I love Tucker. You know, he, he connects those obvious dots yeah. and then people freak out about it and said, but that's what every American was, was thinking. I mean, right. And then six months later, the truth comes out. Exactly. And yes, the virus came yes. from the Wuhan Institute. Of, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's, you're not a conspiracy theorist, but... I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh no, you're fine. I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just, I'm just a guy sitting here saying. You're gonna pay attention and make your. I'm own. gonna pay attention, and and whenever I hear these, I, I had a really good friend of a, a Democratic uh, member of Congress who came to my office recently and was just talking to me, and you know, it was a good conversation. You know, it was it was like, man, you are just derided in the press, but you're actually one of the nicest people to me I've ever met, and I'm. What they say about you means you should hate me. I'm right. like, yeah, well, and so we were talking, and then he started talking about, you know, well, I'm just afraid that Republicans believe in way too many conspiracy theories. And I was like, I understand that we ha it's incumbent upon us to say, okay, no, this is not true. We need to shoot down lies and, and misinformation. But I looked at him, and I got this from a, a skit that I had seen one time. I said, but you don't believe in any conspiracy theories? I mean, you're, you just think that government's out here batting a thousand, telling us the whole <laughs> truth, working in our best interests. I, right. As someone who's worked in Washington for 11 months now, I can tell you, uh, the bureaucratic system there, the administrative state, is not working for our best interests. They are working for theirs. Right. And just like go on Wikipedia, like, exactly. not that Wikipedia is the best source, but like read about MK Ultra. Exactly. Like read about what the CIA yeah. did in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Like are they all done Deps. doing that stuff now? Yeah, like, like, absolutely not. One suspects not. Institutionally right? ingrained in that. And we've seen just in the last, uh, really since COVID, I guess. Sometimes I want to say the last year, but it's actually like we're coming up on year two. That's crazy. Of this new. Well, two weeks to slow the spread. Two two weeks to slow the spread turned <laughs> into like 500 days of sheer dystopia. Exactly. But the experts have had a bad go of it. They've gotten a lot of stuff wrong mm. and in so many cases right what's a conspiracy theory today turns out to be like the truth in six months like it was this really um interesting moment for me just to realize because i thought it was from the wuhan institute of virology right like i thought it was made in a lab probably released accidentally but who knows but you weren't allowed to say that and and all of our friends they were getting kicked off twitter for saying that and it's so that it was made in a lab and then one day um you know i think the evidence started to mount up and there was just that shelling point where one day who was it? Uh, John Stewart. Yes. He was just, he, he's, he did it in his you know, funny style and he's just like, it was made in the lab, people. And then he, he broke that window and then like everybody had to concede it was made in the lab. Even though but Trump, guess what? Those people that are kicked off Twitter, they're yeah. not brought back. And it's, Trump said that like a year before. Trump's exactly. like, I've seen some intelligence that suggests it was made in the lab and everybody made fun of him for it. Yep. So it's just, you look at the point, manipulated spike proteins and all of these things, you look at, I mean, it clearly was created by gain of function research. And the thing that disgusts me the most is that we were funding it. I mean, the American tax which taxpayers. Which Fauci lied funny. about. It's one of my favorite things is just to watch Senator Paul. Gosh, Rand Paul is one of my just. biggest mentors in Washington. 
He's and cool. I, I will tell you, the way he's been going after Fauci, I, I think he's doing the American people service because it's showing that there is now going to be this new wave, this new generation of Republicans and conservatives that are going to hold the other side accountable. I mean, you lie to Congress, you go to jail for five years. That's, that's, that's what happens, which is interesting because Congress is allowed to lie to the American people every day, but you know, we won't get into that. So I'm interested, like, you talked about having friends on the other side of the aisle. Not many. Not many. Yes. But like, how does that work? How do people actually get along? My impression is that people fly in, vote, fly out, and it's just no, no relation. And maybe that's fine. Maybe things are so polarized. Maybe it's like naive to think everybody should get along. Or if you actually just go and you get along with these people, like, don't you just become part of the swamp? Don't you become I'm not part crying of the crocodile part. tears. Yeah, you don't want to go along to get along. Right. But you do want like good relationship. How do you know? Like, which Democrats can you actually work with, and, and which, God bless them, are just. You know, there, there are some people which, you know, I actually will refuse to hang out with, even though they'll say, hey, you know, work's work, but I, I can leave that to the side, you know, let's just, let's just I, I can leave work at work and we can just go get a drink and all these things. But then I look at them and I'm just thinking, you are literally deceiving my personal generation into believing that the most lethal ideology that's ever existed that was accountable for killing 100 million people in the 20th century, you were trying to convince my generation that that is a good thing. And so it's, it's just... I, I can't be associated with you because, I mean, I really believe what you're doing is wrong and evil. I think yeah. you even know it. Um, but then there are other members who, you know, they're more of those JFK Democrats, the, the ones that you've probably seen before. Um, and they're not so bad. But it's interesting because this is a sad state of affairs. Anytime I will hang out with them or meet with them, and really it's only probably about three that um, – are either one, not crazy socialists, which I refuse to hang out with, or two, willing to hang out with a Republican. Um, but we have to meet in secret. I mean, we'll, we'll Interesting. figure out reasons to be kind of in the same area. And then, you know, I, I, I remember I'd, there have been times where I'll sit at a table and they'll get a table right beside me so we can just sit there and talk. But, it's, but my uh, sense is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that's to manage optics on their side. Yes. Like you're willing to be seen with them. Yes. They're not willing to be seen with Oh, you. absolutely not, because they, they, their side has to be a monolith. Yep. And they have to believe that you are either a Nazi or a racist or a white supremacist or a uh, nationalist or whatever they want to call you. And then they, if they are seen hanging out with somebody who they are saying is evil, so that you should punch in the face and you should attack, then that, that's wrong. And Blake, I'll tell you the reason why. It is because once you sit down and have a real conversation with somebody, like the length of time we've been speaking now, you get past all your pre-recorded responses, all the things that you've been indoctrinated and brainwashed to believe. Right. And it takes you to a point where you then have to have a real conversation and have original thoughts. And I think that's a critical thing we're missing in American culture today is so few people have to actually offer original thoughts that they don't have to rely on common sense. But once Americans start sitting down and having a real conversation and using their common sense, which is, you know, they spend billions of dollars to say is wrong, uh, but in your heart, you know, it's true. Yeah. I think the American people will realize that 80, almost 80% 80 of all the issues, we actually do agree. Right. And, you know, maybe we disagree on how much help you should offer someone when, they, when they're down and out. But aside from that, we all pretty but much... The principle of the offering principle. help, we can agree on. Exactly. The principle that it should be a safety net. You bounce, you bounce out, right? It's not a perpetual underclass exactly. that you're keeping it's on a, the it's, it's a safety trampoline. We should be able to agree on that. Right. People don't want to defund the police. No, they want more police. Not. People know it's not racist to have to show voter ID. Yep. People know you should have like a border. As yep. between having like no border and maybe a country, a real country has borders, people know. But it, it's, I feel that too, and I see that on the campaign trail. It's like 70 or 80% of people, because I talk to obviously like right wing Republicans and the activist you know, wing of the base, but also just like moderates and centrists. And it yes. seems like everybody's looking at what's happening, and 60 or 70, 80% of people are like, this is not good. Right. Like, I'm a Democrat, and I don't like the Biden administration because it doesn't seem competent. But then when you when you tune into the media, it seems like it's just 50-50, and everybody said each other's throats. Exactly. That's so, like, how do we mobilize this Biggest this thing, majority? Biggest thing, it, it is actually, um, I, I talk on a lot of different talking points than most Republicans do. Uh, most kind of right-wing activists, which I, I follow the line of, I believe that that class of people is actually changing a lot. And these people who used to be what you would call moderate or centrist, you know, I think they were just apolitical. They just really were, they, they just, you know, they, they would show up and vote. They're, they believe in their civic duty. But aside from that, they're just focused on raising their families and having a good job and, yep. and worried about their own lives. And I think that the thing that the Republican Party has been missing for six decades is when they just want to talk about corporate tax, policy, corporate tax policy or GDP increases at the end of the year, they believe that we're an economy. 
and that just happens to reside in a country. Whereas I believe we're a country that has an economy that resides inside of us. Right. And a good economy is a symptom of a good society. And I believe if we start changing and tooling our message to talk about dining room politics, the stuff that affects the young family who's got you know four kids under the age of 10, if we start talking to those people, to those moms who have been labeled ra uh, radical domestic terrorists domestic by terrorists. the FBI, uh, then at that point, I think that's when all these people who used to be like, oh yeah, I'm a centrist. Now they're a right-wing activist, but being a right-wing activist, they say is extreme, but we just believe buy land, get married, have kids, be a Christian, you know, it's okay. You Didn't you, okay, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw the ridiculous amount of outrage you got on your announcement video. Yeah. When you said that in this country, you should be able to have a single income, be able to afford a house, send your kid to college if you want to. Don't send your kids to college, terrible idea. Um, and, and you should be able to survive and thrive on a single income. And one, I, I believe that the reason the institutions have supported this idea of, oh, you need two incomes and this third wave of feminism. And, and, and again, I, I don't care if it's the husband or the wife that has the income. It, it's, up, it's up to their family. That's whatever they want to do. But we should have an economy that is so strong that we shouldn't be sitting here debating minimum wage. Right. We should be talking about maximum wage. We should be talking about how we are the most successful economy in the world and we've lifted more people out of poverty than any civilization in all of history. That's right. what we believe. It's so fascinating that that is a controversial point of view. Isn't it? You yeah. would think that's one that 100% of people can get behind, and it's like, okay, do these you know, Republican policies get us there? Do the Democratic policies get us there? Like, how do we get to this awesome place where people are prosperous enough to choose? Uh, but no, the left wanted to say that was sexist, you know? And it's like, like you just said, I don't care if it's like, the, the wife wants to go to work and the husband wants to stay at home, or maybe both people decide their careers are super important to them and they're gonna make it work and hire a nanny, like whatever, people do different things, but you should have a choice. You should have what a I choice. What I think the left hates is the fact that if they let that be a free choice, like I personally don't think you would see a 50-50 breakdown. You would not. I think you'd see a lot more women want to stay at home and, and yeah, kind of uh, take on willingly and happily, cheerfully, uh, a more traditional gender role. Exactly. I think you'd I think you'd see that. But like people should be free to do whatever they want, but I think the the modern left can't stand the idea of some sort of unequal outcome, even if people are just sorting themselves out. In the infrastructure bill, I think the craziest little bit of pork that I saw, I don't know what the dollar amount was, thirty million, thirty five million, something like that, to study it was a Department of Transportation study, to study the gender imbalance in long haul trucking. Because it turns out. <laughs> it's like an 80-20%. Oh, no, no, down. no. It's like a 97 <laughs> to 3. <laughs> Have you ever seen a woman truck driver? Never. Not ever. I'm sure they're out there. They're probably really good at it. Because if you're going to go and be a woman and do that, you really want to do that. Because it turns out, you for whatever reason, great at that job. they don't want to do that. Yes. Like, it seems like a really hard and brutal job. And you're on the road all the, the road, time. A lot of hours gone. It, um, it's a masculine-dominated industry. And who cares? That's fine. I don't see why that's a problem. That's what it, it, it's certainly not a problem that's going to be solved. Yeah. It, it, if it's a problem, it's not going to be solved by uh, giving thirty-five, you know, million dollars to Pete Buttigieg so he can He'll probably go on create some fake fraternity leave again. <laughs> fraternity leave. Yeah. He's too busy. He yeah. can't show up to work <laughs> during the supply chain crisis. Uh, but this is how it works, right? It's like they they are um, obsessed with everything being 50-50, which I think just means erasing the differences between men and women. Yes. And then pretty soon you get into this really weird scenario where you're watching the, I think it's the University of Pennsylvania swim team. And all of a sudden you've got a guy who is a very good male swimmer. Yes. Now he's identifying as a female and just crushing it. He's beating all the women. And normally you win by like one or two seconds in those sports. He won this last meet, I think by 45 seconds. Yeah. He had time to sit there and have a snack. I mean, it's it's insane. It's not good for women. No, it's not. It's it, not. It, it is to, I and mean, it, let's talk about scholarships. At, at yeah. even. I mean, if I'm a guy, I can't afford college. I want to go to college for some stupid reason, uh, and I'm like, huh? Well, I don't. And you don't really have any values. I would say, well, why don't I just go compete as a woman? I'll be the national champion, literally whatever sport I choose, because there is a biological difference between men and women, which is a fact. And then I'll get all the scholarships to be able to go. And it's just going to hurt women. It's, it's awful. 100%. I remember uh, July of this year, President Trump came to Phoenix. A turning Point Action sponsored a rally to protect our elections. Yes. Election integrity rally. And um, the president was in great form. He was very funny. You, you're better friends with him than me. He's got that uh, comedic timing. Right? Yes. He's genius uh, at the comic level. But he was talking about this, I think, in the news um, at that moment was there was some weightlifter who had transitioned or whatever, but was now identifying as female. And the president was like, have you, have you seen this guy? He just crushes this competition. I've never seen anything like it. 
he just picks up the weight and it's like one handed poof, poof. And then, <laughs> but then I'm going to butcher it because I'm not President Trump. He's just so funny. But then he's like, look, I like to win. If I'm the coach of the women's weightlifting team, I might be trying to recruit a bunch of guys like this, you know? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I want to win. Of course. That's just if we let that. You get all those banners in your gym. Of you win. let that happen. Yep. And it's like, where, how did we get here? How did we possibly get here? Eighty percent of people know this is bullshit. Yeah. Well, Blake, I'll tell you, this is the thing that is so disgusting to me. And I'm a strong Christian. I, I believe in Judeo-Christian values. I really think it's 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 what creates a good society. It's great. But very seriously, I'm an anti-atheist, and that that sounds strange to say. But I believe that the radical left is trying to create a culture where we are all godless. And we are all genderless. And there is just confusion and rage and anxiety waging inside our soul. I think that we all have a God-shaped hole inside of our heart. And we all try to fill it with something. And, you know, I, I just would really hate for them to say, oh, well, being religious is awful. I think it gives you a, a true moral standard by which you can say, oh, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And this predates any form of government. Mm -hmm. And that way, whenever somebody wants to get up and, and well, let's say they radically take over all our states because of some election rigging. And then they try to change our constitution. I can say, wait a minute, I understand you're trying to change our constitution and do all these things, but let's remember, and thank God for the Bill of Rights, let's remember that there are rights that are inalienable that predate the form of government and come from a higher power. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I genuinely believe that if they start turning this into a genderless society where all, you know, it's 50-50 male truck drivers and female truck drivers, you know, the only way they're going to do that is by destroying probably, what is it, 93% of all male truck drivers by having Elon Musk create uh, autonomous driving trucks. Um, right. And it's not 50-50 because then, not. even if they get to 50-50, the liberal project doesn't stop there because they don't even like the distinction between men and women, right? There's 300 genders or however yes. many your eight-year-old is learning about in school today, right? And so, it, I mean, I think you're so right. You said God-shaped hole in the size, or, you know, in the human heart. And I think there is a religious impulse. Yes. Right? And I think that's, I happen to believe I'm a Christian too. I think that's God, you know, trying to pull us back to him in, in some sense. but. But for the, the militant atheists, for the secular liberals, um, progressivism, right? That's become the new, it's, it's the, the new religion. atheist church. Yes. And it's doing all the same work. And you have the, the you know, sacrificial liturgies. And I think this is why the left is so obsessed with abortion, right? It's the sacrificial ritual. And it's, I mean, it's ghastly, right? The problem is there's no um, redemption. There's no forgiveness. You know, this secular or progressive religion doesn't have any of the benefits of actual religion, which is truth and beauty. And, and, you know, it's, and so it's a dead end. But people believe in it. They do. People believe in it, and I mean, I, I think this is it, this is just it's the communist impulse, right? Blake, I'll tell you, it, 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 communism is so arrogant to me. It is so arrogant to believe that as humans, we are so incredible enough, we can fix every single societal yep. ill yep. in the entire world. When I genuinely believe that we are fallen, we are we are, we are not perfect. Uh, we have a duty to try and be as perfect as we possibly can. But at the end of the day, we will all fall short, and we have yep. to rely on God to be able to fix that. But, you know, Blake, everything that we're talking about, this is why I'm here in Tucson, Arizona. You, you know this is a long ways away from the mountains of North Carolina, my beautiful home, which I will say, this is a pretty area, but I, I think it's pretty mine, nice. I think mine wins just a North little bit. North Carolina's cool, too. Yeah, my, my mountains are pretty great. But um, the reason I wanted to come here is because, Blake, I have since, and we all joke, you know, because the capital split into two sides. You got the Senate side and the House side. We all joke whenever we go over to the Senate side, it's like, oh, we're at the country club. You know, you almost feel like there should be elevator music yeah. playing. Everybody's kind of lackadaisically moving around. It's an old body. It is. It really is. And the, the reason why I think there's a problem in the Senate is because the Senate has a lot of these career politicians. You know, they started out as a state legislator, then they became a state senator, and then they became a congressman, and then they became a, a, a senator. And at, at this point, you know, they've kind of forgotten what it's like to be a, a normal American. And yeah. so they are now to a point where they're legislating as someone who's been behind, you know, red velvet ropes, bulletproof glass, and bodyguards for the last 30 years, instead of someone who's raising a young family just like you. Yeah. And I think that a lot of these career politicians, you know, they always caution me, oh, this is just another election, Madison, don't worry about what's in the news. It's, it's, it's you know, this, there's, always, there's always a crisis. Don't, don't get too worked up about it. And I agree, you, you need to be able to not get too worked up about things, but this is not just another election. This is so critical. I, I think that we are at a point in this country where there are literal people on both sides of the aisle, the radical left and some other people who are saying that they want kinetic forces to meet. 
And I think that we have an opportunity in the next four to six years to really change the direction of this country, get everyone sitting around those dining room politics, the, the core values of Americanism that unite every single one of us. And that's why I wanted to come here, because I want a senator, one who's young, so I can relate with you and hang out a lot, uh, but two, someone who realizes exactly what's at stake. Because I think people who were raised in our generation, you know, we have realized kind of what that indoctrination was starting to look at as we were coming up. Yeah. And now I'm sure you're just like me. If you look back and you start magic, I mean, that's how bad it was then. Imagine what the kids are going through now. Yep. And I will support everyone's constitutional rights. And I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you're trans. I don't care if you're Muslim, black, white, poor, rich. I don't care. I will support your constitutional rights. That is my duty. I swore an oath to it. I will, I, I, I will fight on your behalf no matter what. But as soon as you want to start pushing this leftist ideology onto children, right. as soon as you want to start pushing this radical communist manifesto onto our children, that's when I believe we all have a duty to stand up and say no. And that's why I think we're going to see a landslide election. That's why I'm here for you, Blake, because I know you're going to go to Washington, D.C., into that Senate, and you're going to be you know, like a Josh Hawley, like a Ted Cruz, like a Rand Paul. You guys are going to stand up and say, this is ridiculous. The yep. American people want action, and you're going to take it. Yep. Well, thank you. And. Um couldn't say it any better myself. I think 2022 is existential. Yeah. You know, wow. everybody That's always says this election is the most important election of all time. You hear that every year, and maybe the stakes do kind of increase every time, but you just look at what the Dems want to do. Yeah. Like if they actually get a legislative majority, right? They want to pack the Supreme Court. They want to uh, federalize elections. And they're saying this out loud. Out loud. I mean, so imagine what, what are We're they talking gonna... about in the back rooms? It's nuts. It's actually nuts. It actually is nuts. And well, we got to talk about guns. You know what? The Second Amendment scares me. I, I just, I, you, I, you, I know you're probably like me. You believe that it was created for hunting and sporting rifles, and you know, it's, it's. A, no, I think I, I've seen you a lot. This is a big reason why I became a supporter of you early on. Uh, I think one of your very first videos, you, you were showing an SBR, and you said this weapon was not made for hunting. Right. This weapon is designed to kill people, and at the end of the day. That's what the Second Amendment's about. It's right. about your ability to defend yourself. It's about your ability to resist tyranny. And that's why I think that we have got to, you know, I think we need to abolish the ATF or really hev heavily limit them because really they regulate my three favorite things, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Um, but then more than that, you know, we have this r ridiculous unconstitutional uh, NFA system that is here literally restricting our Second Amendment rights. It's yep. insane. Yep. Federal gun registry, <laughs> arbitrary characteristics, right? $200 right. tax stamps. We have a lot of work to do. Nine to, month waiting time to for dismantle a, that. For a I've got a, an M911 um, machine gun that's yeah. been in jail for 10 months now. Oh, that's insane. And something Now, that's a me, precious metal, in my opinion. <laughs> it's going to be very cool. Uh, I'll bring it to North Carolina, or you can come back here once I get it. But who knows when that's going to be? Yep. It's arbitrary, and it's I arbitrary. have no rights to it. It's just yes. whenever the ATF happens to, and I'm sure they look at what I'm doing right now, and of they probably they don't are. like it so much. And so maybe this thing will never actually yep. get in my possession. But. Um, I think liberals always make fun of us when we say the Second Amendment is about fighting tyranny. You know, and at Joe Biden earlier this year I said, like, we got like F 16s and tanks, man. Like, what's your AR 15 going to do? And I don't think he realizes the twisted logic of that. It's, it's basically an implicit threat. He's, He's saying, threatening like, the American people with, like, what do you, with the U.S. military. What, what, are you, what are you going to do? Like, blow up the neighborhood? Like, you're not going to do that. And exactly. we've seen in Afghanistan, we've seen in Iraq, you've seen in all sorts of instances how, like, small arm guerrilla resistance actually does prevent tyranny. I mean, we saw it in America with our founding. I mean, we, we right. played a war of attrition. We knew that we weren't going to beat them outright in a, in a battle. And I think, you know, if you've ever watched the play Hamilton, you know. The, 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 I haven't. I'm glad. Oh I'm, I'm proud to say that I have not. I've resisted the sirens. No, it's amazing. I know the guy's a radical liberal, but he does a great job of portraying what happened in that war. And it was where George Washington was like, well, we're not going to beat these guys in open combat. Uh, so we're going to play a war of attrition. We are going to fight against them in guerrilla style tactics. And that's what we did. And then actually that is what the generals of the Viet Cong studied to then fight against America in Vietnam. Interesting. And so, I mean, it, it, it's very interesting that these small armed guerrilla attacks, they do work. Um, and then you see places that don't have that luxury, like Australia. And you see stormtroopers beating people in the streets. But you're trying to have a smoke on their patio. Yeah, police officers coming up, opening them a little envelope. So you posted this on Facebook. What exactly did you mean by hashtag <laughs> no vax for me? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it's, it's kind of funny, but it's a nervous laughter because it's, it's like, actually oh, super well. Huh, yeah, we're not Australia, but it's like, holy well, shit. Well, you ask what happen. the left is talking about behind closed doors. If they're talking about adding Puerto Rico as a state, you know, not because they care about Puerto Rico, but just because they want to control the Senate. I mean, that's Machiavellian. That's out there in the open. What do they talk about behind closed doors? Yes. I think they talk about disarming us. I think they do. I really do. Like, I'm running against Mark Kelly here, and 
He's one of the worst senators, but I mean, he was an astronaut. Okay, that's fine. That's cool. That's that really works. cool. That works one time. Um, <laughs> he's been to space like once. But he also, <laughs> yeah, inter international space station space. Not okay. even like space. You know, it's the sign of the decline. You're just it's in not, orbit, it's man. Not I mean, going, do something impressive. Go it's, to the moon. It's not his fault that NASA <laughs> lot. You know, we lost the ability to go to the moon. I, it, it's because of our forefathers that we, you and I cannot commercially go to the moon right now. And stuff. That's Elon true. Musk is fixing that. Yes, he is. God I will one day smoke a cigar in <laughs> orbit, and I'm very excited about it. Um, where was I going? Oh, but Mark Kelly. Like for five years before getting in the U.S. Senate, ran Giffords, right? That one of the nation's preeminent gun control nonprofits. You're kidding me. And no, he'd. I mean, they set it up, and look, his wife was like horrifically attacked, right? Uh, like a, a real victim of of gun violence. Many people were murdered that day. This happened like a quarter mile from my parents' house in Tucson, right up the right up the road. And she she was she was um, you know shot in the head and almost lost her life. And like that's bad. Obviously, like murder's bad. It was political assassination. Maybe I think the guy who did it, he had a Glock, and he was like a crazy person initially. Um, adjudicated as unfit to stand trial, but like none of what they want to do at Giffords, you know, regulating SBRs, taking away people's normal semi-auto AR-15s, none of that would have prevented that tragedy. Not at all. You know? Not at all. That's and what's it's so like, asinine of their ideology. It's about taking away people's rights. Meanwhile, the it, left is soft on actual crime. Yes. Like, you want to talk about gun violence, fine. It's a problem. There's, uh, it's mostly handguns, right? Yep. But there's three or 400 rifle murders in the country every year. It's like everyone's a tragedy, but it's a big country also. Right. So there's so many guns, very few rifles are ever used to commit crime. It's handguns, handguns are the problem. And then if you look at the statistics, it's like half of that problem is suicides. Yep. And it's like a genuine mental health crisis. And a lot of it also is gang violence. And then the other half is gang it's, violence. It's, Which, does the left want to do anything about gang violence? Oh, absolutely not. No. Oh, wait, black on black crime? No, that does not They just exist. want to take away your AR-15. They yes. want to take away my Glock. But guess what? Who's still going to have it? The gangs. Absolutely. And then everything's going to be a soft target. This is the reason why I, I hate the fact that we have all these, you know, these school shootings are awful. They're tragedies. I believe they could be stopped if we would have armed security at all of our schools. Yep. If people realize, oh wait, I'm going to face lethal retaliation, mm, maybe I don't want to do that. But if you say, oh, I'm going to go into a thing, the worst I'm going to face is a teacher throwing a marker at me. Right. You know, maybybe they're feeling a little stupid and brave at that point. And you know, this is something that I, I will probably get me in trouble to say, but it's a... Excellent. That yes. probably means if it's not true, it's directionally yeah. right. <laughs> In this country, all I think we were talking about these, you know, these 300, 400 rifle deaths every single year. All of them are a tragedy. Everything's a tragedy, and I never want to mitigate the human suffering. But I will tell you, I, I think it is the duty of a statesman to be willing to suffer tragedy, to prevent something so much worse. Sure. And I, yeah, well the, the, these rifle deaths, the, the suicides, the gang violence, all of it's bad. But I believe that the fact that the United States of America, our citizenry, has weapons, the fact that you know a Japanese. Uh, Admiral once said, no, we won't invade the American homeland. There'll be a rifle behind every blade of grass. Mm -hmm. Well, our government knows that too. Mm -hmm. And I will suffer these tragedies to prevent a genocide because that's what will happen down the road if we have all of our weapons taken away from us. Whenever somebody talks about wanting to disarm me and take away my firearms, it makes me wonder, well, what are you about to do? Because it yeah. sounds like you're probably about to do something that I would normally shoot you Why for. are you so interested in exactly. that, Exactly. <laughs> it's like, huh, it's, it's a little weird that you want to take away my gun right now and say it's, it's an interesting My situation. guns have never killed anybody. Not once. I hope they don't ever. That ne that, and but I genuinely believe the fact that people know that you have guns will probably mean that you never have to use them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. An armed society is a polite society. Exactly. That's and why we I like can all sound. pine for, you know, a, you pine for utopia where like gunpowder is never invented and everything is perfect. But like we don't live in that world. We don't live in that we world. In and conservatives know we never will. Right. It goes back to what we were talking about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago, right? It's like conservatives know that yes, the human heart has great capacity to do good. Yes but also great capacity to do evil. Jordan Peterson's actually, I'm a big fan. Gosh, he's, I love him. He's been really good, I think, at taking what I think are like Christian messages. And he, he's so close to becoming a Christian, I genuinely he, believe He it. basically is, but I think his job actually, right, within the broader sort of mission, his job is to secularize that and to give that to people who yes. aren't there yet. Yeah. And so he will tell people like, um, I actually think you posted this recently on social. It's like, you should be a monster. You should understand that you are uh, a beast. You're, you're yeah, a human being, but you're also an animal and you're capable of evil. But then you should have that in check, right? Yes. Like the dangerous man is the weak man who doesn't have control right. over himself, who, who might even think he's righteous and all good. And that's more the progressive side of things. The conservative knows that he's capable of evil. And because of that, 
You care about the rule of law and enumerated powers. You care about this stuff. The left just, they think they're righteous. They think they're purely good. And that is the most dangerous thing. I'll tell you, my father gave me a hatchet when I was really young. Hmm. Wonderful little device. And if you know much how, about- How young? Uh, I, was, I think I was probably eight. Okay, all right. Yeah, you know, that's I, pretty young. I, yeah, it's pretty young, but I have woods behind my house. I like whittling and you know, me and my brother's favorite toy was a stick. So you chop down a little sapling, you've got a perfect bow staff, it's great. Um, but he gave me this hatchet and I remember he, he was talking to me about it. And the overall lesson that he imparted on me was that with this hatchet, you know, it's two sides, all hatchets have two sides. One has the bladed side that you can then use to chop down a tree to destroy things, to hurt things, to, to break things. But the back side of a hatchet is a hammer, it's flat. And you can use that to build. And the message my father imparted with me is that you, you son are a hatchet. As a young man, mm -hmm. you are a hatchet. You have the capacity to destroy, which is far easier than building. Mm -hmm. You have the capacity to destroy things. Or you can hone your abilities, you can control yourself, and then you can turn that hatchet around, use the hammer side, and build a beautiful society. And that is what we all have to realize we are. Because so many, and this is the reason why I think a lot of kind of uh, the punk rockers, the guys with tattoos like me, a lot of them are turned off by the American Christian Church is because they, they see a lot of weak men. They see a lot of, of doormat people who aren't, aren't willing to fight back. And I believe that is because, you know, we do a poor job of, of reiterating, you know, with our, this beautiful English lexicon we have, of what words really mean. And when they read that word that we are called to be meek, they infer from that that we're still called to be weak. Mm. We're called to, to not make a ruckus or anything that, you know, well, will Jesus always turn the other cheek? It's like, yes, but... Jesus also flipped tables and beat people with a bullwhip when they were doing, it, it, it destroyed their businesses and these people ran away from him because they realized he was so powerful. And then when he is going to come back to the earth one day, he will have a tattoo on his thigh, you know, a fire sword in his hand. I mean, it, it's a man who has his abilities under control and meekness is perfect power under perfect control. Mm. And I genuinely believe that the secular left is trying to feminize and, and, and remove the competitive instinct. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this applies to young women too, but specifically young men. They're trying to sheathe our competitive instinct because mm -hmm. they don't want people who are going to embrace the, the toughness and the difficulty of life because those people are easier to control. And life is tough. It is very life hard. Life is difficult. Life is difficult for everybody. My everybody life has, has been so hard, but because my father taught me at a young age that life's not easy. Not everything was bubble wrapped. Right. He let me fall off that tree many times. And I knew the ground hurt, but then he also taught me how to get back up again. And, right. and that's, uh, that's what conservatives how do we How do we deal with that? Like you're, you're in Congress, right? And, and um, you know, you're just at the, the beginning of a, what's gonna be a hugely successful political career. I'm trying to get into politics. Uh, I think it's gonna work. We'll but, dominate together. Okay, we'll dominate together, but, um, but we'll be in Congress making laws, and when you see this cultural problem, and I agree with you 100%, it's, it's making society effeminate, right? It's, it's saying that all masculinity is somehow toxic, toxic masculinity, and therefore there's no good masculinity. How do you solve that? It's such a cultural problem. I wish there was a constitutional piece of legislation so we that we do. could just do, but we know there's not. Right. What do we do? So I'll tell you, and, and Blake, this is something that a lot of people in Congress don't like to hear. I do not believe this country is going to be saved through legislation. I genuinely don't. I believe this country will be, that legislation we can enact is to slow down this, this communist train that's trying to come into, into you know, the, our, our mecca of our world and, and re-envision America into this Marxist society. Um, I believe the best thing that we can do in Congress is to remove more rules and regulations and, and go back and get rid of a lot of these laws that we have passed in the, in the past. So again, like I said, I don't think this country is going to be safe through legislation. I believe it's incredibly important work and we need to give it our full attention because it, it's very beneficial and helpful. I think the way this country is saved is when people who feel like they have a moral conviction and duty to serve their country stand up and, and fight for our country, it inspires other people. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I hear from people from every single generation, like, you know what, you really encouraged me to get through this hard spot, especially people in wheelchairs, especially people who are going through de tough stuff. They're like, man, you went through all that, you had a traumatic brain injury, you're paralyzed, you you were in a hospital for almost 13 months, and look where you're at now, I mean, that's incredible. Youngest congressman. Yeah, the youngest congressman, and there's a guy younger than me in the, the 17 or 1800s, so if I go back in history. He doesn't matter. Yeah, thank you. God bless Thank him. You. Yeah, God bless him. Uh, <laughs> He's, yeah. But I, I, I will just say this. I think that the way this country is saved is if we stop 
idolizing weakness and, and, and debauchery in our country. And we start really just surrounding people with beauty and with and greatness and giving people role models they can look up to. Giving people the idea that, hey, you know what? God, you were created fearfully and wonderfully made and you were called to do great things. In Genesis, it says, go out and take dominion of mm -hmm. the earth. And mm -hmm. Like go make the world serve you. There's I have that on my on my, my campaign yeah. website is one page and in the sort of environment and resources section. Yeah. And I say like man is called to subdue the earth. Right. right. We're we're called to take dominion of the earth and, and and to control it. And I think that that's one reason why I'm kind of a green conservative. You know, I, I believe in making our country a better place. I think the best way to be green is to create all of our energy here, to tap yep. into the great, wonderful abilities that fossil fuels have given us. I think yep. that we need to create many more nuclear power plants all around our country. Absolutely. Harden our grid. It's right there in the name. Conservative. Exactly. We should conserve, right? Exactly. Teddy Roosevelt conservatives. Right. I love taking my boys to national parks. It's amazing. Like we want a we want love healthy, Teddy Roosevelt. One of my healthy air, clean water. Yes. But what we don't want to do is just speak only in the abstraction of climate change, right? Which I think that's just uh, uh, emotionally manipulative. That's just right. AOC, you know, trying to turn to play on people's fears. Well, to say, we, we, Give me the keys to the global economy. It, it's coming. Twelve years is coming up, where the world's going to end. Twelve years, all, and then it comes, and then it's like you know, in the '70s they were worried about global cooling. Right? Exactly. It's like I'm, I know that uh, we shouldn't just be polluting, um, but but like you said, it's like using our fossil fuels well. And right. then also investing in nuclear, which we know is safe and cheap. And Literally, principled. you heat up a rock, you put it in a containment center, it creates steam. And then that steam powers a city. That's the cleanest thing you can get. But they yeah. just want to say, oh, no, 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 that there was that Netflix documentary on Chernobyl. Right. We're never having a nuclear power plant. Super, yeah, I think we lost the propaganda war on that decades ago. But we like, did. we just got to fight the next we'll battle. We can win it. Right. Let me check the time. Kyle, what time is it? 14. 14. Great. We got like eight minutes. Um, Get the reset. So, uh, is that Stephen? Is my suit clear? Ready? Can you make sure? If you're wearing a suit, then I have to wear a suit. Do you not want to wear a suit? I texted Amalia to see if I could wear this. I probably shouldn't wear this. Do you always dress up? It depends on the crowd. I don't know what the target. I don't know what the crowd. Is. I think this crowd's going to be. I don't know where my phone is. Let's break for like. The great thing about once you once you have honorable in front of your name, you can dress whoever you want. Yeah, because like everyone, anywhere you go, everyone's like, "Wow, oh man, I'm overdressed." Yeah. Or like, "Oh gosh, I'm underdressed." They never yeah. say you're overdressed. No, you're the standard. Yep, it's it's great. I love it, dude. That was fun. That was great. We should do a lot more of those. Totally.